The Whips have agreed that item 21, the motion on living wage in Wandsworth, will be taken next. Can I ask Councillor Rigby to move and Councillor Wintle to second the motion in their names? Yeah, move the motion the for the living wage. Seconded. There is uh, an amendment to this motion that has been circulated. Can I ask Councillor Bryn to move and Councillor Peter Graham to second the amendment? I move the amendment. Seconded, Mr Mayor. We've got speakers. Councillor Rigby. Yeah. In the 21st century, poverty is one of the most troubling issues in our society, which is why I believe it is important that we all, re all unite to ensure that people can earn a wage that enables a decent quality of life. It is absolutely right that local authorities in London and elsewhere lead by example by signing up to be accredited living wage employers. Local authorities are setting an example to businesses in their areas where many could afford to follow suit and those are not my words those are the words of Kevin Hollingrake Conservative MP and chair of the all-party parliamentary group for poverty a life on low pay often means working longer working hours limiting community and family life being paid the living wage can mean the difference between just about and earning enough to afford the things that most people agree are needed to live, such as a decent meal, a warm home, a birthday treat for your children. With inflation set to rise and real wage growth stagnating, the need for a wage that meets the cost of living has never been more important. As shapers of society, local authorities have a key role to play in actively supporting the living wage movement in London. We cannot continue to abrogate the poverty of people who in the end go out each day to work on the council's behalf, even if that work has been contracted out. We've all signed up for the social mobility pledge, but that's just not achievable when you're too exhausted with the stress that poverty inflicts. We have a duty of care to ensure that we are creating social mobility for all. And research from a London authority that has become living wage accredited shows that the largest group of beneficiaries are black, Asian and minority ethnic women aged 41 to 59. Um, I don't know wh how closely you read, Councillor Cook, I don't know how closely you read the Cardiff report, but what it does say is that 70% of the businesses absorb the costs without making significant changes. And I'd love to know if you've spoken to all of the authorities, because the case-by-case case is linked in 98% of cases. The motion we put before the Council was action oriented, transparent and measurable. There's been lots of lines put through that motion and it's come back looking a little bit woolly and a little bit ambiguous. So I want to be clear what support means. When I say I'll support something, I put my full weight behind making it happen and I hope that's what you mean by supporting it. To support our contractors to become living wage employers, we'll need a road map, we'll need milestones and an end date. Support equals a proper plan, not wooliness. And we're ready and eager to work with you to create that road map. Let's get cracking on it in the new year and put a date in our diaries when we'll fly the living wage flag over this building. It's too late to pioneer in this space, but as more local authorities become accredited, we're in danger of being last of the party. And Mr Mayor, I want to end by putting on record our huge appreciation to our colleagues in Royal Kensington and Chelsea, who delivered on their support pledge to become the latest London authority to become accredited living wage employers. Thank you from everyone here in Wandsworth. Councillor Peter Graham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, first of all, I should say that we are understanding of the issues around pay and we are sensitive to that. That's why we pay the London living wage ourselves as a council. It's why we encourage businesses to do so and we are encouraging contractors to do so. But how we move to for forward to do that is not an easy question. And I was a bit surprised sitting there listening to Councillor Rigby because a fortnight ago, 
her colleague, Councillor Gibbons, uh, brought a paper to the fi Finance and Corporate Resources Committee arguing for accreditation now, but no compulsion about awarding London Living Wage, no insistence that people did so. In fact, he said he wanted bids with and without leaving the council to choose. Tonight, Councillor Rigby's motion says that we should have no choice about it, that it should be automatic when we retender that London Living Wage is there. Those two things are not the same. A fortnight ago, Councillor Gibbons was arguing that pragmatically, your party on that side should break your local manifesto pledge and back something that was evidence-based and gave a way out if it was not practicable. Today, belatedly, Councillor Rigby is reinstating it. The trouble is that Councillor Gibbons has also referred up his own paper. So, a fortnight ago, we had a U-turn on your manifesto. Now, we've got another U-turn to reinstate it. And then later this evening, in this same meeting, you'll U-turn again to back Councillor Gibbons' motion and paper, arguing that we shouldn't be doing this at all. And unfortunately, that is the kind of consistent, clear, and unequivocal behaviour that does give Councillor Rigby's piety a certain piquance. But um, let's not be unfair, because it's uh, Can I neither come back on that? Gibbons Can I come back on that? You just mentioned me. Oh, point of way. person, person, point of whatever that is. <laughs> right, seeing as, you, seeing as you mention me, you can carry on with this technical back and forward. There's just one thing. You become an accredited living wage employer. That's it. Yes or no? Uh, the thing is, becoming an accredited living, living wage employer. Uh, hang on, Councillor okay. Peter Graham. Um, Councillor Ruby, that, that wasn't uh, a point of personal explanation. <laughs> Councillor Peter Graham. I, I, I'm always happy to give way to members of the opposition who wish to make points. Um, the, the trouble is, becoming accredited doesn't mean you actually pay it. Um, we had this argument out at FCROSS. You have to have a plan. But it wasn't clear what your plan was. It wasn't clear what the milestones are. It certainly does not mean automatic on retendering, which is what you've put down tonight. And nor do you have to be accredited to do that. We're not accredited now, but we're paying the London living wage to all of our employers. You don't need to be accredited to pay it if, if you uh, have contractors. And the reality is that no borough, contrary to Councillor Hogg's point, no borough in London appears to be paying the London living wage to everybody. Islington, which you've hailed as an example, started their policy back in 2012. It's taken them six years. So your chance of sort of a fair day's work for a fair day's pay for a hard day's work, when is that day? In 2024? In 2030? Or immediately as we retender, which is what you're saying now. There is no consistency there. And I would also remind you that it is not a straightforward issue. On Monday night, I was at Meshkar Hassan to listen to the arguments that are being put there and hear what their staff and their patients and, and, and people being cared for were saying. And it was very clear that they were caring for their staff, that there was um, a, you know, a consistency there, that they had retention. And Mushkar Hassan pays the national minimum wage, not a London living wage. So all of the points you're saying, trying to hold up employers or those that don't pay it, as somehow bad or callous, are simply not true. And you know that's not true because you see people in the gallery whom you recognize as well who don't pay it. The, the reality is that there is a cost. There is a cost. Not always, but often. And Councillor Gibbons went some way to acknowledging that. And you tonight, in this motion, are not. He plucked a figure of £5 million, practically out of thin air, and then dismissed it somewhat airily as well. But he was prepared to say there was cost. He also had a way of managing it, which is that you didn't necessarily have to pay it. That would have still caused problems, and his paper was full of problems, but it was a more honest approach than the one you were putting forward this evening, which you can only put forward because you know you wouldn't actually have to deal with the consequences of it. If something costs more, that money has to be found elsewhere. That is either a reduction in the quality of those services or it's a reduction in other services. Unless you can identify that money, you can't honestly stand there tonight and say that this is the way forward. Good intentions are not enough. You also need to have a coherent position. And frankly, between yourselves, you haven't even got a coherent position within this meeting.
Uh, Councillor Rigby, I, I apologise. Um, you, you, you stood up and you uh, caught the mayor's eye, and Councillor Peter Graham gave way. So, perfectly okay. Um, I think at this point, um, we just say no pressure, but anybody who wants to, to leave the chamber because you've been here long enough or whatever, um, you're, you're, we'll pause uh, to allow you to do that. So now, now's your opportunity um, to, to leave if you want to. Okay, it's obviously riveting stuff. Councillor Wintel, maiden speech. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Mayor, for allowing me to make my maiden speech in this debate on the London living wage. It is an honour to be standing here as the first Labour councillor in St Mary's Park for 28 years. Yeah, yeah. Not the last. It is also a privilege to be speaking in Wandsworth Town Hall, as this is where my official life started. Nearly 38 years ago, my father registered my birth in this very building. I spent my early years living in Schubert Road in East Putney. After a brief South East London interlude, I returned here 16 years ago. So having lived here half my life, I can truly call Wandsworth home. St Mary's Park is also special to me, as for many years my granny lived in Vicarage Crescent. I have fond memories of Sunday lunch in Battersea Square and walks along the Thames. The Riverside location is one of the key things that gives St Mary's Park its character, including its beautiful views. Canvassing sessions always need a photo break at the top of the tour blocks. The, the historic St Mary's Church, Battersea Square, the amazing shops in Battersea Park Road are joined by many outstanding charities, including KLS, Carney's and Keys House, all of which do so much to support residents and create a strong local community. Without these organisations, the community would be a much poorer place. Historically, Battersea is named after an original settlement next to, Batter next to St Mary's Church. While St Mary's Park was home to some early manor houses, it was mostly underdeveloped until the 19th century when industrialisation, including the local flour mills and candle factory, led to development of the area. However, many people were living in slum-like conditions with high levels of poverty interspersed with areas of prosperity and double-fronted Victorian villas. In 1882, Booth's Poverty Report described the area as mixed. 120 years later, the area is still mixed, and this makes it a great place to represent. Growing up in inner London diverse communities have been part and parcel of my life, but this has also driven my strong-rooted labour values. I am lucky to have grown up with so much privilege, but I also saw that there were many who were not so lucky and didn't have the same opportunities. My mother remembers me asking as a five-year-old, why didn't we share all our money because that would be fairer? While my views have developed somewhat, my principles remain the same. I want a fairer and more equal society. These values, alongside watching the local community becoming more and more divided by disastrous conservative austerity policies, are what drove me to stand as a candidate. During the election campaign, I met one family who re reinforced my decision to keep fighting for a Labour victory. An elderly, disabled grandmother, two parents and three teenage children living in a one-bedroom flat. The walls were black with mould and three teenage children were sleeping alongside their parents on mattresses on the living room floor. To get home, they had to walk past luxury riverside flats built for millionaires and property developers, but not the local community. And the most astounding thing was that two members of this family were working, but working for a minimum wage. To me, this family represents why the campaign for a London living wage is so important. It is not enough for Wandsworth Council to pay its own directly employed staff the wage. It now needs to set an example 
and pay it to all staff working for them in any capacity. Recently, we all voted in favour of the Social Mobility Pledge. While we recognise that there are many actions to be taken as part of this, Wandsworth Council must lead by example. Not only does paying the London living wage impact some of the most vulnerable in our society, allowing them greater financial independence and a wider range of life choices, it also makes business sense. Taking action does not need to be complex and it doesn't need to be achieved overnight. We are merely asking for a small step change and for the wage to be built into new or re-tendered contracts. A small change for the Council, but one that could have a huge impact on so many lives. It is an aspiration, but one that we can make happen if we are really committed. It's easy to find nitpicking reasons against this, but the fact that so many councils are now adopting it means it can easily become a reality. When discussing London Living Wage at Committee, Conservative members spoke about making work pay. But I am saying tonight, make work at Wandsworth Council pay and make it pay a London Living Wage. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Winthall, for a very powerful speech. Maiden speech. No, uh, another maiden speech. Mis Mr. Mayor, point of order. Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Understanding Order 28A, I move that the Council meeting do now adjourn for 19 seconds to consider the number 19 bus. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed that one. Uh, sorry, have you got a second? Uh, uh, I'll second Councilor, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Morgan seconding me. Councillor Hampton. Uh, who, who's your seconder? Councillor Morgan. Councillor Morgan. Morgan. Seconded okay. Go ahead. Thank you. I was elected to be a champion for my residents. Tonight, I am the voice for all those people who use the number 19 bus. St Mary's Park has the overclouded Clapham Junction nearby, but no tube, so our residents rely on their buses. It is a vital part of our daily lives, commuting to work, taking our kids to school, and our elderly residents need buses to help them live independent lives. Quite simply, it's how most of us get round this great city. The number 19 has run to Battersea for over 100 years, so it is long established and we know well used. Councillor Morgan and I submitted a petition of 2,260 signatures to TfL. They told us that there's been a decline in usage. You tell that to Lorraine, who tells me that when she's going on her commute at 6 a.m. in the morning, she's standing at that bus stop at Battersea Bridge and there's a queue. You tell her that, TfL. TfL want to remove the whole of the number 19 from Hoban to Battersea. They were also very coy about the way they went about their consultation. It wasn't widely advertised, and the complication of trying to sign online was really, really difficult. Even posters put up on bus stops were ripped down. That certainly wasn't by the local community. TfL, there's real dismay and anger in my community, and you need to listen to us. We don't want any more excuses, we just want our bus. But you know what? There, there is one person who can save the number 19 bus. And yes, that is the Mayor, Sadiq Khan. Actually, he can, you know. He, he does lead the GLA, and uh, as far as I know, he leads TfL as well. We have an increasingly frustrated user population and a travel system that is not good enough or what Londoners deserve. I call on all of you and the GLA member sitting in this chamber to put political differences aside. Let us all 
lobby the mayor on behalf of our residents. Let's do this together and save the number 19 bus for all of these people. Councillor <laughs> Cook, do you, you wish to respond? Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would uh, very much like to, uh, in another nice uh, piece of symmetry, a 19-second adjournment. Uh, question 19 on the order paper is also about the number 19 bus. Uh, it's just as well we're not talking about 485, isn't it? Um, I, I absolutely agree um, with uh, Councillor Hampton. Um, I'm horrified by what has unfolded uh, around the number 19. I've taken a very close interest. Uh, that very impressive petition of 2,200... That is less than half the number of people who use it every day. That is a very, very well-used bus. And what is more, it is more well-used with every passing week, every passing month, because the population is growing. And the Royal College of Art is growing, and all the students and the staff there use it. Uh, it is really beyond belief that TfL think that they can remove this service. There are so many reasons why it should stay. First off, congestion. We all know it's far better to get people onto public transport and out of private cars. We know it's better for air quality to use buses rather than cars. So why on earth are they even thinking about it? Uh, it really is quite, quite beyond me. Um, I challenged the Deputy Mayor for Transport at a London Council's meeting about a month or so ago. Uh, she had quite rightly made the point that... Um, that uh, buses, uh, buses have to change, they have to evolve with demand and population change in the city. Uh, lots, of, lots of routes are changing at the moment. So I challenged her over the number 19, uh, and uh, she, she absolutely agreed. We must respond to demand. So I would ask our Assembly member, can you please follow that up? Because it seems to me that the logic isn't being followed. This is a very, very well-used service that is going to cause huge, huge problems if it is removed. And it just should not be happening. It defies all logic. And I very much thank my colleagues for the, the petition and the opportunity to talk about it uh, in the chamber. Point of personal explanation, please, Mr. Mayor. I've been named by just both of the last two speakers if you don't mind. I'm sorry to take up people's time, but the implication from both of the last two speakers is that I've only been responding on the number 19 bus um, as a result of their desperate pleas to me. M Melanie Hampton, you know very well that we've been in consultation and I've given you all the information you needed to ensure that the petition... What's a personal explanation on that one? Can one you, email that even, I sent to you, you asking for Mr. your Mayor, help... Councillor Hampton is unable to keep her no, mouth shut no, when no, other people are speaking in the, the chamber. Name, my name. I think you better wait, Councillor no, Hampton. No, 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 no. Why don't you wait? No, no, no. Why don't you wait? I, I sent you I one don't think, email. Councillor Hampton. Councillor Hampton. I think you called by the Mayor, Councillor Hampton. Councillor Hampton. I think you called by the Mayor. Actually, you know what my email said. I called by the Mayor. My Councillor email Hampton. said, Councillor Would I Hampton. deliver it chief to the Whip mayor? Is about to ask you to be quiet. I think your own chief whip has uh, asked you to do what okay, we all I think we've got to do, which is ask yeah, you to yeah. be quiet. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, Councillor Leone Creepy. <laughs> well, we're all Let's trying to Let's now save... return to living wage versus London. We're all trying to save the bus, and you oh, right, know that sorry. very well. Councillor There's been Hampton. a number of petitions... I've also challenged Councillor Cooper, the look, I think we have enough Mayor of this one. for transport, as you have. I have. Look, I used to live on Battersea Square, as you probably know. I've used the number 19 bus. In fact, I have friends who lived at the other end of the route. I may be the only person in London who's used it from end to end. I've been making strong representations about this already. And I do not need to be encouraged by anybody in this chamber to make representations. I'm listening to the public and not to you playing games. Cut. Councillor Hampton, Councillor Hampton, Councillor Hampton, Councillor Hampton, will you stand up, please? I'd like to ask you, do you want to withdraw your adjournment motion, or do you want it to be voted on? Okay, we're now going to return to... Uh, London living wage versus living wage. I'm sorry your maiden speech has been uh, somewhat uh, delayed. Councillor Byrne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Tu. Thank you. Um, I first came to know Wandsworth over 20 years ago when visiting my elder sister who lived here, there, or lived here at the time, first working with the learning disabled women of St Mary's Home in Roehampton and later on with the rough sleepers in the refuge on Cedars Road. But many years before this, my paternal grandfather worked as a labourer in Britain in the second, during the Second World War and afterwards, sending money home to his family in Ireland. This money was clearly wisely invested in my parents, who went on to give their six children the very best start in life. Later on, I came to live in this great country myself, and my interest in local politics began when I was a junior doctor in North London. I had saved and saved to buy a flat, and such a thing is very possible on an NHS salary. And I joined my local residents' association in Kensal Green. I pay tribute to them tonight because all over London there are groups like them who are doing the best for their communities and trying to get the best for the streets in which they live. But unfortunately, most of the time, in the face of an intransigent Labour Council. So many years later, when I was appointed a consultant at our local hospital, St George's, I came back to live in Wandsworth. And I've now lived on the Shaftesbury estate for nearly 10 years. This was, estate was built as an experiment in social housing. And it had four classes of houses, according to where the socialist elite felt that you belonged in life. It also had a ban on pubs. But of course, like most socialist endeavours, it soon ran out of money. And so to this day, we are left with a square that still has two sides. This estate it gives our ward its name, and it is my great pride not only to represent the people who live there, but those who live la around Lavender Hill and the north side of Clapham Common. In fact, Mr. Mayor, in the coat of arms above your head there, Shaftesbury Ward is the only ward in the borough directly depicted by the Sprig of Lavender. It is a ward home to no less than 15 Grade 2 listed structures, and these range from K2 phone boxes to artisan cottages, the art centre and the old parish Battersea boundary markers. These markers are quite significant because our residents say on Queenstown Road, Wix's Lane, the north side of Clapham Common, can see from their front doors how better kept their streets are and how better maintained their green spaces are. You forgive me if I've forgotten my place in my speech, I'm sorry. It off by heart. Uh, but right. Shaftesbury is also time. home to many EU nationals like myself, and I've joined two excellent colleagues, Councillor Cook and Councillor Senior, here on the front benches. I've also, since election, done a lot of casework, and I have nothing but profound respect for the officers here at the Town Hall who have gone out of their way to help residents. And I have met people who work in great teams like the Youth Offending Team, one of whom told me that having gone to work in another borough, she returned to her colleagues here in Wandsworth and she described this as being like a homecoming. We are here to serve. We are here to scrutinise and to support. We are not here to relentlessly criticise. And so far I have seen councillors sit very silently on committees, only to go home and later behind the security of a social media screen or iPhone, report scorn on the council, which we are all working hard for. And we are all here to do the best for our residents, not to score points off each other. I will also dispense with the tradition of paying homage to one's predecessor, because events have shown that the public are not interested in centrist or single-issue candidates. When the choice on the day came down to bust-in activists, Corbynists, or the Conservatives, the people chose stability. However, I would, stability is 40 solid years of Conservative administration in this borough that has made it the enemy of London. Uh, Ban, hang on a second. Uh, it's, a, it's a maiden speech, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, the choice came down to that. But however, however, I have no hesitation in paying a tribute to Samantha Heath, who, despite a serious illness, got the most votes for her party in the ward. So, turning to tonight's amendment, if anything, over the years, has reinforced my Conservative beliefs, it was the last Labour government. When people in public service jobs like mine became weighed down by arbitrary targets, so I know that setting any uncosted, blanket minimum as the motion stands will only serve to create a race to the bottom in terms of pay. Our amendment, however, will allow us to continue on what matters to the taxpayers of Wandsworth, and that is the quality of our services, services that have made us the envy of London.
Thanks, Councillor Byrne. That was a heartfelt and very well delivered maiden speech. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you. Um, can I just. You've got 10 minutes, Councillor. Ah, yes, thank you. I, I don't intend to use um, anywhere near that, but thank you for the indulgence. Um, thank you also. Uh, and picking up Councillor Hobbs' comment earlier, I think this is exactly the kind of debate we should be having in this Council Chamber. So thank you for the um, motion, and I hope I'll go on to address why our amendment motion is not um, a woolly alternative, but actually the, the necessary alternative. I, I want to start, and echoing um, Councillor Graham's words, by making very clear that it is very much part of our Conservative values that we think work should pay. We agree that if somebody does a, a hard day's work, they should get some fair pay for it. We agree that if somebody goes to work on behalf of their family, that they should be afforded a, a reasonable uh, living standard. Uh, and that's why we, as a council, back the London living wage. We do. We back it, and we've shown we back it. So that, that is not in question. The, the issue here and the debate is really around the extension of this motion, which goes towards mandating the London living wage for, um, for third parties for contractors. And I, I know you can get into the nuance of whether it's a mandate or whether um, how it's provided for in, in the contract. But ultimately, it's, it's making a requirement to a third party who may not otherwise have made that decision. And I think that's, that's where the problems arise. And I think that's for, for, for a few reasons. I think, firstly, um, we have to look at, actually, what the, the policy is here. I think we can continue to talk about how, how, how positive and useful a, uh, an increase in pay is, and of course it is, and we'd, we'd accept that. But the living wage, we, we also have to accept, is not a long-term solution to wage stagnation. We're living in a very unique and interesting time where we have um, some of the lowest unemployment that this country has ever seen, and yet not the expected wage growth that you would look to see. And, and actually, there's huge disagreement on all sides as to why that's happening. And there's lots of reasons we can posit around this, the structure of the labour market and the like, but that is not what one expects. And therefore, the, the living wage is a good way and a good um, test case to try and boost productivity in the short term, and that's indeed why George Ellsbourne introduced um, the scheme under a, under, a, under a Conservative government in the, in, the last, um, in the last five years. But ultimately, you are not going to see uh, sustained wage growth through an imposed living wage. You need to see a growing economy and you need to see improved productivity. So the focus, more broadly, must be on improved productivity. And then we come on, I suppose, to the problem for us in terms of as a, as a, as a customer and as a, as a, a tenderer of services. We are a local authority, and so we do, unlike many um, provide, um, contract purchasers, we do perhaps have a social justice objective in, in, in some of the things we do. But unlike a lot of the companies that you have pointed to in, in the recent paper and in the case study, we don't make a profit. Um, all of our money is, is spent on services for the benefit of our residents. Most of it is, many, much of it is statutory. Um, but the rest, and as we've said many times in this chamber before, is about making sure that every pound we spend maximizes the benefit of our residents. And I think that's where we have a problem with a proposal. Can we be sure that the pound we spend on taking the cost, and there will be intended costs on many of these contracts, uh, contracts, is the best use of that pound? It goes back again to what I was saying a second ago. The living wage is an imperfect solution economically. It's a very blunt instrument. You can't see who is benefiting from it. The, the, research, show, the research shows that, that many of those who are on uh, a minimum wage are actually not in the poorest households. They're, they're, they're in high-income households. That's why there is a 25-year-old threshold for the, for the national living wage. I'll, I'll take you at the end, if you will, because I'm, I, I, otherwise I'll forget what to say and it will become dreadful. But I, I, I see you. Um, so it, it, is a, it is... Sure. Uh, sure. It, so it is a very blunt instrument and there is a concern. And I think where we come from, and this goes exactly to the social mobility point, is that if we are spending a pound somewhere very uncertain that may not actually have that benefit, it may mean that we're not spending money on either the capacity to deliver our, our great regeneration that we're doing, or on, um, there's a question in here which you'll have seen the benefit of on, for example, our jump starts and our future first schemes. Again, these are things around skills, training, the very things that provide social mobility, the very things that provide um, pr uh, pay progression. 
Because what the, what the London Living Wage will do is it will raise the floor, and, that, and that's why it's good, and that's why I encourage it, and why we've got an amendment to encourage it for other businesses. But ultimately, what the research is showing is that in three or four years, we're going to have a much larger pool of people who are still in a pretty tough job. It's just a little less miserable. And what we want to see, what we want to see is true wage growth. We want to see people who have an opportunity to take that further. They're not always stuck on the minimum wage. They have an opportunity through their skills and the opportunities that have been generated locally to move on, to do more. And that's why the focus needs to be in how we spend our money on the full picture and on improving productivity. So that's why we've got a problem with mandating this, because it's actually a social mobility focus that we have here. The London Living Wage alone won't deliver social mobility. It has a, has a role to play, and that's why we support it. But we must encourage businesses to follow us. We shouldn't mandate them. And that's why I've proposed the amendment. And I, I beg you all to support me in doing that. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Grimm. <laughs> Thank you. Just, I, I mean, I... Just one very simple question I'm following. If the, no, the living wage is so uncertain, then why is Wandsworth signed up to it for its own staff? And why does one, and indeed, why does Wandsworth make such a great play of the fact uh, as a great thing that it's done yeah, to do that? it's a good question. There does seem to be an inconsistency. No, thank, no th thank you. I'll answer that within my, my time, if I, I may. It's a good question. I'm not saying that it doesn't deliver. I'm saying as a policy solution, and that is effectively what we would be by doing by taking your, um, uh, your motion to fa effectively mandate it. It will not solve it for the economy. It is a good thing for a single employer. If they, to, to, if they can see the benefits within their organization, which they many will and they should, to improve productivity, uh, to improve staff retention, and you know, to helping those who are finding it difficult. It is a good thing. But as a policy solution across, because otherwise you could just mandate, you know, we'll, we'll pass legislation to mandate a, you know, a living wage at you know, 50 grand. It just, it, you will have unintended consequences in, in the economy. So that's, that's why you can't do it. And I think, to, to, go to, to go to your point on trumpeting it, I think that's partly the problem with this. It's a great campaign, but you know, there was a, a huge upswell of response earlier by, I think it was Councillor Rigby, about accreditation is all that counts. Well, why is it accreditation that all that counts? Because you know, ultimately the accreditation here is from a campaign group, and they've been very successful. But there's no reason to say that that is, you know, that there's some independent campaign group setting a particular number is actually is, go is going to deliver the best benefit for the economy. Nothing at all. The most important thing here is that we are delivering a fair pay for our workers. We're encouraging it in the contracting partners we do, but we're focusing every pound we spend on improving productivity and improving training and job opportunities. And that's what this council wants to do, and that's what we'll continue to do. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Gibbons. Thank you. Um, I think it's been really good to have this discussion um, about the living wage for all staff serving the council and our residents, which is what I hope the paper that I put forward would achieve. Um, now, I recognise that we've had some disagreements over particular elements of how we might reach uh, paying the living wage. But frankly, I think we have to consider we should do this by whatever means necessary. Um, there are all sorts of uh, points that we could clear up in terms of implementation and uh, the, 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 uh, those are easily available for you look online. There's plenty of information about how to do this. There's plenty of people to consult. Um, if we talk to other boroughs where they've tried to implement it and come across problems, I'm sure our officers who are incredibly able will be able to find ways around those obstacles and obstructions. So I, I think if there, is a, if there is a strong will to implement the living wage, then I think we can all do it, and particularly if we work together. I'm quite happy to work together with members from the opposite party here on how we might implement this. Um, I think the important thing to realise, though, is that poverty is avoidable. Um, low wages, uh, problems with benefits and so on are... One of the reasons why people, for example, turn up to food banks. Um, if we make sure that people are paid a proper wage, we will avoid the need for using food banks. And I'm particularly struck, incidentally, over the weekend, a number of Conservative MPs did co go along to food banks wearing Christmas jumpers as if the, uh, the, the, those food banks had absolutely nothing to do with them. 
We can do things about poverty. It's not a natural disaster. It's something that we have control over. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about confusion and contradiction in things. There is a contradiction between the, the answer we have in question two on our council questions about the council has always taken the view that we should not intervene in the external market by instructing contractors what wage they should pay their staff beyond what they're legally required to do. That seems to me a very rigid ideological interpretation of how you might conduct things. And the fact is that... Um, Although this, this uh, amendment is extremely weak, it is actually a bit of progress from that ideological position. It's actually a step in the right direction. Fact is that when we put this motion up, we completely cheated. We, we copied it word for word from Kensington and Chelsea, a conservative borough, where it was proposed by two conservative councillors and unanimously accepted. Um, so the only word we added or changed was Wandsworth for Kensington and Chelsea. And in fact, their proposal was actually stronger than some of the things I came up with in my paper. Um, so I, I'm very disappointed that uh, we haven't actually, or, or it looks as though we may not uh, fully uh, back what uh, our colleagues across the river have proposed. I think this is progress. It's not really what we wanted for Christmas for our residents, but there is a good will to actually make some positive progress. But it's not far enough. We need to move towards adopting the living wage, the London living wage for our workers in Wandsworth. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to finish off by a bit of wisdom from the Beach Boys in their uh, uh, Christmas classic, Little St. Nick, uh, where they point out that Christmas comes this time each year. Um, very sage advice. Um, but actually Christmas comes earlier and earlier. Uh, it starts in November, which incidentally is the same time Living Wage Week starts. So uh, for next year, uh, we'll be having another debate on the living wage. We'll keep on pushing, we'll keep on fighting until we have the living wage flag flying above this town hall, as Councillor Rigby says. Could you give way on that one? The matter now before the can this council is the Conservative Group Amendment on the Living Wage Motion Agenda Item 21. Please indicate by a show of hands those for the amendment. Those against the amendment? <coughs> the amendment is carried 29 votes to 25. Which reminds me, uh, after Councillor Gibbons' uh, reference to Christmas, um, after, this, um, after this meeting, can we, can we... After this meeting yeah, I hope you'll come to the parlour for um, mince pies and possibly wine, <laughs> or mulled wine anyway. Not very strong. <laughs> right. Okay, now we're now on to uh, questions to the uh, cabinet. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Right. The motion has amended. Is it the same numbers? The motion has amended. Okay, sorry, we're going to the motion as amended. Can we have the same numbers or do we need to vote? Okay. Is the motion as amended agreed? Is the motion as amended agreed? It is. Okay, brilliant. 